Good afternoon. I'm here with my guest, um, uh, Susan Richmond. How are you doing, Susan? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me, Doug. Okay. Um, glad you can be on Poet to Poet. Let me read an introduction to uh, Susan. Um, Susan Ed Rich Edwards Richmond writes about the relationship between humans and wild nature. Um, she has published four chapbooks of poetry, Increase, Purgatory Chasm, Birding in Winter, and Boto. And her work has appeared in many journals and anthologies. She's a passionate naturalist. She's a poet in residence at Old Frog Pond Farm and Studio in Harvard, Mass., and works at Mass Audubon's Drumlin Farm Wildlife Sanctuary. She lives with her husband, Jim, and they have two daughters. This is her first full-length uh, collection. I'm surprised this is your first full length. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Purgatory Chasm technically is a full chapbook. length. It's sort of a chapbook and full length. Gary uh, said it's uh -huh. kind of on the border because it's 40, I think it's Gary 48 Metris pages. Gary Metris of the Adastra Press, yeah, go, who also published, published this. Right, and, yeah. Published before with Birds. And now he's just, I had him out at Endicott College, and now he's the uh, Poet Laureate of um, Northampton. Yes, Not very East exciting. Hampton. East, East Hampton. Hampton. They East just Hampton. inducted him on Saturday. Very right. exciting. So do you think there is, um, you know, this book is very nature-based, as you're mm -hmm. a very nature-based individual. There's another mm -hmm. one, Wendy Drexler, who writes a yes. lot about them. I you know her well. Her. Yeah, I interviewed her. She, uh, she but anyway, do you think, come out last do you think there is an urgency, even more of an urgency, to write uh, about nature now as we find ourselves increasingly divorced from it, mm -hmm. I think? I, I think that, I mean, I certainly feel most at home in nature, and that's where I'm most inspired, but I also do feel that it's important to write about nature and give people the experience, if they can't experience it directly, at least to try to give them that experience through poetry um, and make them want to preserve it and want to understand it and seek it out, because I think when you realize how many thousands of people really live without nature, um, I think it's part of our humanity. We're connected to nature. Well, we're, we're talking about beings. owning dogs and cats, yes. and they sort of um, they bring us back. Right? That's true. Yeah, having a pet is a connection to the. Do you think poetry world. would be a, is a good way of communicating to the layman about you know? I mean, per people mm -hmm. aren't particularly interested in poetry uh, yeah. about nature. What do you think? Um, I'm really interested in place-based poetry. So a lot of my work is very grounded in a particular location. Sometimes I write whole series like Purgatory Chasm. This book was all about one place, Purgatory Chasm State Reservation in Sutton. So I spent a lot of time there. And so it is a way to, I think, immerse the reader in a place. It can be with the description. Um, poetry can be very sensory, as you know, that it's not just description. It can be um, to talk about scents and sounds. And so I do think that you can. It's obviously not quite the experience of being in nature itself, but I think you can give someone the experience, okay. uh, a natural experience through poetry. And people have been doing it for years. Yes, right? it's obviously, yeah. <laughs> now, some of your poems in this issue, um, Before We Were Birds mm -hmm. by Adastra Press, some of your poems deal with this spiritual form that takes the shape of dolphins mm -hmm. called and Brazilian. You know, it's interesting, I, I, I was asking a cook at work. Mm -hmm. I use Brazilian. I say, you ever hear of Bado? It means dolphins. And he says, he says, well, not really. It, it means it's the spiritual. It's like the it's people, the, the shape, tribes. It's the, the shape tri shifter. He says the people on the, you know, and the tri tribal people. Yeah. So it's the shape of dolphins. Yeah. Um, you know, now, what draws you? I mean, to mm. these creatures, dolphins and their spiritual form or whatever. Yeah. Uh, what What is it about them? Well, um, I mean, first of all, I think that part of my being interested in place also is, th is mytho the mythology and the stories that are told about places and, and yeah. animals. Um, so I think I first be actually became interested in the Bodo because I was doing environmental curriculum for a group called the Jason Foundation, and it was place-based education. So they would sort of have a virtual trip to a different location each year and then do a curriculum around it, and it would culminate in a live broadcast. And they went to the Amazon, the Peruvian Amazon that year. I didn't actually physically go, but it was sort of a virtual trip for me. And there was an interview with a shaman from the rainforest talking about this bodo, and I had to deal with the transcription and present it in the, in the curriculum, and I was just fascinated by the story. Did you ever show you a bodo? I mean, did you ever see something um, like that? I have seen lots of pictures of them, and I became interested in research of them in Cy Montgomery. So in other words, you saw yeah. pictures of the spiritual being? Oh, no, oh, no, no, no. no, no, no. no. <laughs> But, I mean, the stories go oh, yeah. that 
the 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 bodo can come out of what come out of the river and transform itself into a human being okay. and you can't tell the difference except oh. they were all, so there were certain signatures like it might be wearing a white hat or dressed in white and women can't resist them women can't resist them right um, but you know I think there's also a little bit of the stories of you know there's an unexpected pregnancy oh it must have been the bodo oh, yeah. <laughs> always the bodo always the bodo but um, lots of people in the Amazon do have this belief, and there's this world underneath the Amazon called the Ancante, and where these creatures dwell, and they have they think of them as having this fully developed civilization under and the water. And they're very ma macho kind of, I think. Um, I mean, yeah, they're very self-confident. They are. Yeah, yeah. yeah they yeah, have to be for the work they do, luring yeah. people back under the <laughs> under yeah. the river waters. Right. Yeah. I yeah. just I just found it really fascinating, and uh, I mean, a lot of cultures have this sort of transformation myth. Um, a lot of cultures have bear transformation myths, like our Native American culture. So I'm interested in, in all of that, that mythology. Right. Now, um, there's a sense that maybe you don't, I don't know, mm. but, but the sense in the poems that this, uh, that one, like I remember in the f reading one about the snowy owl, mm -hmm. and it yeah. was almost like you want to merge into yeah. nature. I mean, t can you talk a, a bit about that? Yeah, I mean, for me, being in nature is a transformative experience. I do kind of, the whole rest of the world it sort of drops away, mm -hmm. which is why I think it's really important and when I think about people who don't get that experience and mm -hmm. get so tied up in their own world, they don't get that chance to feel that they're part of something mm -hmm. larger, mm -hmm. a, a whole cycle uh, or a whole network of other living beings. And so um, when I'm, and I'm a, I love bird watching, I'm a real avid bird watcher. So, when I go out into nature with my binoculars and, and watch birds, I could do it for hours and not even notice the time passing, just observing them and thinking about their lives. And Why birds? Um, I've been watching birds since I was a child. We, you know, we were in a suburban neighborhood and there, was, there were birds in the backyard and we had binoculars on the table. My parents were, were birders too, wherever when we'd go hiking in the Adirondacks and listen for birds and look for birds. I think for me, I, I love mammals. I mean, I really love f furred creatures. I had, had a dog myself a for many mammals? years. Oh, no, no, but I guess what I was saying was, the thing about birds is you can always see them. Whereas mammals, like you can always see squirrels and chipmunks, but you're not gonna see much else unless you, at night or in certain locations. But birds, wherever you go in the world, you can see the native birds and, you know, if you get just a little bit out of the city, you're gonna see a, a great variety. They're colorful, you can see them in all seasons. So- Do you think Albert Hitchcock's birds sort of get paid them <laughs> an injustice? <or? laughs> yeah, well, yeah. I think everybody probably has their pet birds that they're not particularly fond of. Yeah, Those yeah. were mostly, where they see mostly seagulls and crows. Yeah. Um, you can see when you go to Kelly's at, uh, in Revere and the, the, the gulls descend trying to steal your french fries, you yeah, can I imagine where a little I bit remember, of that comes from. I remember when uh, Lowell wrote, well, I don't remember, but mm -hmm. I mean, he, he wrote uh, Waking in the Blue, which was about his times, um, uh, about his times at McLean Hospital. Yeah. When he was hospitalized, and I remember he always had that image of crows meander on the catwalk. You know, yeah. It's just, it's just Birds can be sinister. Yeah. I mean, think yeah. of Poe, obviously, yeah, yeah, the yeah. raven. Yeah. Um, there's sort of a bird for every mood, isn't yeah. there? I mean, the crows, the, the owls, that's the whole realm mm -hmm. of mystery in the night. Yeah. But then there's the birds like the cardinal and the cardinal in, a, in the snow in winter that just raises your spirit to see that bright flash of color. Yeah, that always, um, yeah, that always sort of, yeah. Um. And I love the migration season, which we're coming into right now, and you can see all kinds of little jeweled warblers. Right, and there's no the restrictions woods. on these birds for migrating, right? I mean, you know, like the, like Trump would put on. Uh, the, uh, yeah, they they yeah he hasn't figured he out hasn't how figured to build a border wall yeah. <laughs> enough to keep them keep well. The board, so. He would though. I mean, that that's actually a huge concern of mine right. talking about the border wall because it will. No one talks about the environmental impact, but it would. I didn't realize it'd be environmental. Well, maybe not as much for birds, yeah. but there's, you know, animals don't observe yeah, right. the border between yeah. the United States and Mexico, and the Rio Grande is there, and there's lots of animals that are coming down to the, the river water, swimming across. Bears and mountain lions have, have crossed, and if there was a, a border wall, certain animals would have their habitat truncated. They wouldn't be able to 
have their no cross pollination or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 it kind of would have a really serious effect on the wildlife. Yeah, I never, I never read border. much about that, but yeah. Yeah, because no one's talking about that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. obviously, the humans come first. The human, the human consequences are obviously more important to most people, but the environmental consequences are are important too. And there's always a relationship. I mean, you can't separate environmental consequences from human right. consequences. Right, like you were saying, we yep. separate ourselves. We separate ourselves, I think. The, we, sh we should remember that we're part of this continuum, right? Yeah, I mean, if certain politicians spent more time in nature, they probably would have a very different attitude towards themselves, yeah. their but place in life. But this guy Zinsker, you know, who's the head of... Uh, oh, Zinke? Uh, oh. Yeah, Zinke. Yeah. Oh. He, he spent a lot of time in but Only in Montana, where he lives. He's well, on his ranch. No, yeah, no, and he's actually very protective of Montana, but for oh, the rest of I the country. Oh, I see, for anyone else. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Yeah. yeah. But, um, but there's a sense in your poetry mm. that you really want to go back to the elemental, like mm. before the baggage uh, of identity um, falls on us. And I think you do yeah. in your title poem, Bef you know, Before it was almost we like birds. The, 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 it was just birds were just, they weren't identified as birds, they're just, you know, creatures, and, mm -hmm. you know, um, who commanded by God or whatever your, your belief is. And, uh, you know, uh, and, you know, so you were describing them in that manner. Yeah. Uh, maybe I misinterpreted the poem. Um, well, the central poem, I think you, you, you can interpret it in a lot of different yeah, ways, right. and that's an element, but the, um, the se central sequence is actually based on Ovid's metamorphosis okay. Okay. story about the Alce King Alcyon, yeah. and okay. I mean, King, King Cy Cyax right. and Queen Alcyon, and when, uh, when Cyax went to uh -huh. consult the oracle, he was caught in a terrible storm, mm. and they suffered greatly, and um, basically he, he, he died, and his wife came to the, the ocean side to claim his body, and the gods took pity on them and resurrected them as two kingfisher birds. So it's a story of metamorphosis of the people suffering in wartime and being transformed into birds and continuing as birds to live and raise their young. And I think like that really spoke to me. I started thinking about that poem after 9-11, but you know, the Iraq wars and uh -huh. you know, just sort of taking you through that, that, and I feel like nature is so healing and it is so transformative that when you go through something so traumatic, there is sort of that, that metaphorical way that nature does, I mean, this is a metaf the poem is metaphorical, but there is a way that nature can heal you. Um, so that's sort of where that, sto that poem sequence went. So before, we were bir before they were birds is when they were the king and the queen, and then they transform into the birds at the end. But I love that mm -hmm. the sort of metaphor that it's also, maybe it applies to us. And that's why I sort of switched it from before they were birds to before we were birds. And you can think of it in different ways. And maybe it's before we were people, before we were birds. Yeah. Now I mean, we're I people. Mean, yeah, poetry is a subjective, yeah. that's like painting, could yeah. be a very subjective experience. So or that's how I before we were birds, yeah, I, we I were something the, else. I didn't like, know the, 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 right, the illusion. the illusion, yeah. yeah. But it could be that you know we're birds now, but before, before we were birds, what were we? Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, now, your poet in residence at the old Frog po uh, Frog Pond, frog pond farm, farm studio mm -hmm. in Harvard, is that in Harvard? Yeah. So what's that about? That's a really special place. Um, Linda Hoffman and Blaise Provatola live there. It's their homestead. Um, Linda is a sculptor and an artist. But she came to this farm, this apple orchard and farm, and decided that she wanted to become a farmer as well. So she brought back the apple orchard uh -huh. as an organic orchard, and Blaze is a big farmer. Um, and they they really sort of fostered this idea of community, where there's a, a meshing of community, agriculture, art, and poetry is part of that. So it's it's a wonderful community of people out there. They have lots of different kinds of events some more agriculturally oriented, some more arts oriented, um, but you realize that there is this group of people who see the connection between arts and agriculture, the way we live on the land. It's, it's not so separate. Um, so, what, so, so what I do there yeah, is, <laughs> is um, I organize a annual plein air poetry walk there. So I 
send out invitations to regional poets. Actually, it started with a very small group. I did this first at Fruitlands, and then we did it at, Har at uh, in Harvard at, at, at Linda's place. Yeah, I, they have something. I did it in Belmont. They have like a... Yes, uh, yeah, they, it's they, really ca catching yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. Where you go... I've been doing it for years. And right? right. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, this is our fifth, sixth year? Do 60 it? years? Six, no, six. Six, 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 six years. Six year doing yeah. it at Old, at old yeah. Frog Pond Farm. And it's grown from the first year yeah, we did it, it was 10 people. And this year we have, I think, more than 30. Mm -hmm. um, so people so what are invited. Else do you do? They just organize that? So I, I do the organize that. Um, so people come and write. And then we put together a chapbook of their work. Wow. And then we have the walk in September. So when you say people come in, uh, uh, chapbooks of everyone's work? No, no, no. People come and they write. We give them a theme. Like this year's theme is past. Oh, so it's like an anthology tracks chapbook. And tales. Kind of thing? Y um, yeah, everybody writes on the theme. You write in situ poetry, so you come to the farm, you think about the theme, and you can write about the pond or the forest or the farm or the blueberry patch or whatever intrigues you, but somehow have it relate to the theme. And then you submit the poem to me, and I put them into a chapbook. And then in September, we have a reading um, that's open to the public, and we walk from site of inspiration to site of inspiration, and the poets all come and they read their poems. And then the larger community comes as well. So last year we had almost 100 people wow, come with the, with the poets. Um, so it's just grown. It's, it's now really only limited by 30 poets is a lot to manage in one reading. <laughs> so, <I can> imagine, <laughs> yeah. um, the other thing that I've been doing there is I have a, um, a mm -hmm. poem of the month okay. blog. So okay. I just post a poem every month that um, sometimes people submit to me, other times I yeah. you know, invite people to submit or find mm. something in a, a journal and um, it says it's not necessarily an unpublished poem most of them have are published other places but it's uh, right. all related somehow to nature or to the farm cycle sustainability something like that. well that's so. great um, you know I want to give you you got about um, oh. 12 13 minutes okay. to read from your work or anything That'd be great. You want from your uh, by the way, you again, I mean, we didn't touch on this. We just touched on it. That oh. It was produced by Adastra Press that used to yep. do letter pre yes. press printing. And maybe you can show an example of, uh, from your earlier book. Isn't that the... Yeah, I was going to read one poem from here. But yeah, the, le the, I <laughs> the letter press is um, really remarkable. And mm -hmm. what Gary does, Gary Mitris, who's the, um, the editor of the press, does that's really kind of unique. And the printer. He prints them in this song. He prints them. He does the whole process. And he invites the poets to be part of that process, which is very exciting. So with Purgatory Chasm, one day he invited me out to actually set a page. So one of the pages in this book I set myself, um, obviously with his guidance, but he showed me he had the whole the type tray and we set we set the type and then we pulled then I pulled it I ran it on the press that one page and then when he had done the whole book he invited me to come back and I helped him uh, sew the hand sew the uh, the pages together so he invites so you really invest he invites in the, the poets yeah, to yeah. actually be well, part of the process unique. so yeah. it's very exciting um, so okay. yeah so I'd love to read I'm, I'm going to start with. Um, a couple poems from here and then there, mm -hmm. and then we'll, we'll come back to this. Okay. Um, I wanted to start because this is the getting to be the bird season. season. Um, birds are starting to nest. Um, this poem is called April Pleasant Bay, and it's uh, about some bird courtship. April Pleasant Bay. Red crest spread, females skitter on the water, a shiver, their own attention to indifference what maddeningly dazzles. Something stirs in the breast of a male, yearning to possess whatever recedes. I imagine spinning on this globe of sufficiency, a single glance enough, the worse misstep to turn too soon, Orpheus reversed. Brackish waters stretch toward sea as waves of birds land, each flock a band, an interval, the bay a roiling cauldron, coupling beneath deceptive calm. Each bird fans feathers like a hand at cards held close to the chest. Females stroke a little faster, a little surer, concealing in drab dress, wobbly zigzag paths, 
intent. So in the bird world, the males are almost always the more brightly, <laughs> brightly colored. Not always, but almost always. Um, I wanted to read one more poem from here before turning to Purgatory Chasm. This course can be uh, as over at Porter Square Books, too. Uh, do you have any of those? or What bookstores do you have them available? Um, I mean, of course, it's on Amazon and all. Right now, yes, it's on Amazon. You can get it through Adoster Press if you Google Adoster Press directly. Um, they're, at, they're at the Audubon shops in, at Drumlin Farm in Lincoln and um, the North Shore at Joppa Flats in Newburyport. Um, I, I haven't got it in... I, in Porter Square books yet. They, I asked them and they said that they, I wasn't local enough. They yeah, wouldn't they carry did, it. Yeah, yes, local, I was yeah. disappointed. I've been meaning to get over to the Concord Bookshop, but I and haven't the got them over. How about the Grolier? I haven't got it in Grolier, Grolier. either. I should. I've, yeah. had, I've had some of my, I've had Bodo and Purgatory Chasm in Grolier before, okay. but I haven't gotten to this one. So this poem is called Jitterbug, and it's in memory of a dear college friend for John Cannon. Jitterbug. When the music starts and it's a fast swing, all he taught comes flooding back. The toe heel, toe heel, step step time that kept us spinning and the duck beneath the arm before he reeled us out and then back in again. Bless those southern manners, the way he'd make us all look fine. He'd greet any woman with a kiss and guide her with his hand in the small of the back. Take his gin straight, but never let it get in the way. His face always looked a little shattered. Too much drink or study or lack of sleep, except when he was cutting up the floor. New York was not North Carolina, though it must have seemed like what he wanted. The street dance of the crowds and constant music. Something must have caught up with him there and kept on going. Something faster than a jitterbug in any college town. I wonder, did he think of us then with his car parked on the bridge? How we used to line up high on the dance for him, ready to be caught and pulled back in from the spin or the dip. Our balance in his trembling steady hand beautiful and i'm just when did he pass away um it was a long time ago i have the uh -huh. dates in here um uh -huh. he yeah he he passed away in his 20s actually wow. he jumped i mean he jumped it was it was suicide uh -huh. so that was very sad um i wrote that poem when i heard and contacted his mother afterwards and she and i helped her get some of his work that he had written self-published mm. so very sad. So this poem, um, it's a, it's actually is a, sort of a long poem. I'm really interested in sequences and series as well because I love approaching a subject from a lot of different angles. And this is Purgatory Chasm, um, all about the state reservation in Sutton. Mm -hmm. And one of the angles um, with which I approached this was there is, if you've ever walked there, there's a series of na named rock formations, Lover's Leap, Devil's mm -hmm. Pulpit. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have some of the poems that are named for those formations. And I have voices of some of the people who died in the chasm while they were hiking. So there's, it's spoken by some of the ghosts and some of the modern day ho hikers. So there's kind of a mix of voices. Um, this is called Devil's Pulpit, and it's in three parts. Um, the first part is spoken by Thordis, Thordis's ghost, one, the pick. I can hide forever in the rocks. In that, I have the advantage. I don't feel the heat or the cold. I can pick any man I want from the wandering crowd. Two, the muse, and this is in the voice of a mm -hmm. hiker. The first time I came with my family, my children played in the caves and crags all day. A curious spot, but one we exhausted. Something drew me back months later in the early spring. Was it only the sound of water dripping in the chasm? 
I could have sworn it was the voice of a young girl flattering me, asking me to follow her behind the devil's pulpit. She had been dead for many years, she said. She had waited for me. She wanted me alone. Three, projection, Thordis's ghost. What else can I do? Sometimes I talk to him, whomever I have chosen, as if he could hear me, as if he could understand.